Book Seven, Chapter Six of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Chapter Six. The old count went home, and Natasha and Petya promised to return very soon. But as it was still early, the hunt went farther. At midday they put the hounds into a ravine thickly overgrown with young trees. Nicholas standing in a fallow field could see all his whips. Facing him lay a field of winter rye. There his own huntsman stood alone in a hollow behind a hazel bush. The hounds had scarcely been loosed before Nicholas heard one he knew, Voltorn, giving tongue at intervals. Other hounds joined in, now pausing and now again giving tongue. A moment later he heard a cry from the wooded ravine that a fox had been found, and the whole pack, joining together, rushed along the ravine toward the rye-field and away from Nicholas. He saw the whips in their red caps galloping along the edge of the ravine. He even saw the hounds and was expecting a fox to show itself at any moment on the rye-field opposite. The huntsman standing in the hollow moved and loosed his borzois and Nicholas saw a queer, short-legged red fox with a fine brush going hard across the field. The borzois bore down on it. Now they drew close to the fox which began to dodge between the field in sharper and sharper curves, trailing its brush, when suddenly a strange white borzois dashed in followed by a black one, and everything was in confusion. The borzois formed a star-shaped figure, scarcely swaying their bodies and with tails turned away from the center of the group. Two huntsmen galloped up to the dogs, one in a red cap, the other a stranger in a green coat. "'What's this?' thought Nicholas. "'Where's that huntsman from? He is not uncle's man.' The huntsman got the fox, but stayed there a long time without strapping it to the saddle. Their horses, bridled and with high saddles, stood near them, and there, too, the dogs were lying. The huntsmen waved their arms and did something to the fox. Then from that spot came the sound of a horn, with the signal agreed on in case of a fight. "'That's Eligan's huntsman having a row with our Ivan,' said Nicholas Groom. Nicholas sent the man to call Natasha and Petya to him, and rode at a footpace to the place where the whips were getting the hounds together. Several of the field galloped to the spot where the fight was going on. Nicholas dismounted and with Natasha and Petya, who had ridden up, stopped near the hounds, waiting to see how the matter would end. Out of the bushes came the huntsman who had been fighting and rode toward his young master, with the fox tied to his crupper. While still at a distance, he took off his cap and tried to speak respectfully, but he was pale and breathless and his face was angry. One of his eyes was black, but he probably was not even aware of it. "'What has happened?' asked Nicholas. A likely thing, killing a fox our dogs had hunted, and it was my grey bitch that caught it. Go to law, indeed! He snatches at the fox. I gave him one with the fox. Here it is on my saddle. Do you want a taste of this?" said the huntsman, pointing to his dagger, and probably imagining himself still speaking to his foe. Nicholas, not stopping to talk to the man, asked his sister and Petya to wait for him and rode to the spot where the enemy's Elagin's hunting party was. The victorious huntsman rode off to join the field, and there, surrounded by inquiring sympathizers, recounted his exploits. The facts were that Elagin, with whom the Rostovs had a quarrel and were at law, hunted over places that belonged by custom to the Rostovs, and had now, as if purposely, sent his men to the very woods the Rostovs were hunting, and let his man snatch a fox their dogs had chased. Nicholas, though he had never seen Elagin, with his usual absence of moderation and judgment, hated him cordially from reports of his arbitrariness and violence, and regarded him as his bitterest foe. He rode in angry agitation toward him, firmly grasping his whip and fully preparing to take the most resolute and desperate steps to punish his enemy. Hardly had he passed an angle of the wood before a stout gentleman in a beaver cap came riding toward him, on a handsome raven-black horse, accompanied by two hunt-servants. Instead of an enemy, Nicholas found in Elagin a stately and courteous gentleman, who was particularly anxious to make the young Count's acquaintance. 
Having ridden up to Nicholas, Ilagan raised his beaver cap and said he much regretted what had occurred, and would have the man punished who had allowed himself to seize a fox hunted by someone else's borzois. He hoped to become better acquainted with the Count and invited him to draw his covert. Natasha, afraid that her brother would do something dreadful, had followed him in some excitement. Seeing the enemies exchanging friendly greetings, she rode up to them. Ilagan lifted his beaver cap still higher to Natasha and said, with a pleasant smile, that the young countess resembled Diana in her passion for the chase, as well as in her beauty, of which he had heard much. To expiate his huntsman's offence, Ilagan pressed the Rostovs to come to an upland of his about a mile away, which he usually kept for himself, and which, he said, swarmed with hares. Nicholas agreed, and the hunt, now doubled, moved on. The way to Ilagan's upland was across the fields. The hunt servants fell into line. The masters rode together. Uncle, Rostov, and Ilagan kept stealthily glancing at one another's dogs trying not to be observed by their companions, and searching uneasily for rivals to their own borzois. Rostov was particularly struck by the beauty of a small, purebred, red-spotted bitch on Ilagin's leash, slender but with muscles like steel, a delicate muzzle, and prominent black eyes. He had heard of the swiftness of Ilagin's borzois, and in that beautiful bitch saw a rival to his own Milka. In the middle of a sober conversation begun by Ilagin about the year's harvest, Nicholas pointed to the red-spotted bitch. "'A fine little bitch, that,' said he in a careless tone. "'Is she swift?' "'That one? Yes, she's a good dog, gets what she's after,' answered Ilagin indifferently, of their red-spotted bitch Urza, for which, a year before, he had given a neighbor three families of house serfs. So in your parts, too, the harvest is nothing to boast of, Count?" he went on, continuing the conversation they had begun. And considering it polite to return the young Count's compliment, Ilaga looked at his borzois and picked out Milka, who attracted his attention by her breadth. "'That black-spotted one of yours is fine, well-shaped,' said he. "'Yes, she's fast enough,' replied Nicholas, and thought, if only a full-grown hare would cross the field now, I'd show you what sort of borzoi she is." And turning to his groom, he said he would give a rouble to anyone who found a hare. "'I don't understand,' continued Ilagin, "'how come sportsmen can be so jealous about game and dogs. For myself, I can tell you, Count, I enjoy riding in company such as this. What could be better?' He again raised his cap to Natasha. But as for counting skins and what one takes, I don't care about that." "'Of course not. Or being upset because someone else's borzoi and not mine catches something. All I care about is to enjoy seeing the chase. Is it not so, Count? For I consider that—' "'A two came the long-drawn cry of one of the borzoi whippers in, who had halted. He stood on a knoll in the stubble, holding his whip aloft and again repeated his long-drawn cry, A two! This call and the uplifted whip meant that he saw a sitting hare. "'Ah, he has found one, I think,' said Ilagin carelessly. "'Yes, we must ride up. Shall we both course it?' answered Nicholas, seeing in Urza and Uncle's red rouget two rivals he had never yet had a chance of pitting against his own borzois. "'And suppose they outdo my Milka at once?' he thought as he rode with Uncle and Ilagin toward the hare. "'A full-grown one?' asked Ilagin as he approached the whip who had sighted the hare, and not without agitation he looked round and whistled to Urza. "'And you, Michael Nikonorovitch?' he said, addressing Uncle. The latter was writing with a sullen expression on his face. "'How can I join in? Why, you've given a village for each of your borzois. That's it, come on. Yours are worth thousands.' Try yours against one another, you two, and I'll look on." "'Rugay! Hey, hey!' he shouted. Rugayushka. he added, involuntarily by this diminutive, expressing his affection and the hopes he placed on this red borzoi. Natasha saw and felt the agitation the two elderly men and her brother were trying to conceal, and was herself excited by it. The huntsman stood halfway up the knoll, holding up his whip and the gentlefolk rode up to him at a foot-pace. 
the hounds that were far off on the horizon turned away from the hare, and the whips, but not the gentlefolk, also moved away. All were moving slowly and sedately. "'How is it pointing?' asked Nicholas, riding a hundred paces toward the whip who had sighted the hare. But before the whip could reply, the hare, scenting the frost coming next morning, was unable to rest and leaped up. The pack on leash rushed downhill in full cry after the hare, and from all sides the borzois that were not on leash darted after the hounds and the hare. All the hunt, who had been moving slowly, shouted, Stop! calling in the hounds, while the borzoi whips, with a cry of, a two galloped across the field setting the borzois on the hare. The tranquil Ilagan, Nicholas, Natasha, and Uncle flew, reckless of where and how they went, seeing only the borzois and the hare, and fearing only to lose sight even for an instant of the chase. The hare they had started was a strong and swift one. When he jumped up he did not run at once, but pricked his ears listening to the shouting and trampling that resounded from all sides at once. He took a dozen bounds, not very quickly, letting the borzois gain on him, and finally, having chosen his direction and realized his danger, laid back his ears and rushed off headlong. He had been lying in the stubble, but in front of him was the autumn sowing where the ground was soft. The two borzois of the huntsman who had sighted him, having been the nearest, were the first to see and pursue him, but they had not gone far before Ilagan's red-spotted Urza passed them, got within a length, flew at the hare with terrible swiftness aiming at his scut, and thinking she had seized him, rolled over like a ball. The hare arched his back and bounded off yet more swiftly. From behind Urza rushed the broad-haunched, black-spotted Milka, and began rapidly gaining on the hare. "'Milashka, dear!' rose Nicholas' triumphant cry. It looked as if Milka would immediately pounce on the hare, but she overtook him and flew past. The hare had squatted. Again the beautiful Urza reached him, but when close to the hare's scut, paused as if measuring the distance, so as not to make a mistake this time, but seize his hind leg. "'Urza, darling!' Ilagan wailed in a voice unlike his own. Urza did not hearken to his appeal. At the very moment when she would have seized her prey, the hare moved and darted along the balk between the winter rye and the stubble. Again Urza and Milka were abreast, running like a pair of carriage-horses, and began to overtake the hare. But it was easier for the hare to run on the balk and the borzois did not overtake him so quickly. Ruge, Rugayushka, That's it! Come on!' came a third voice just then, and Uncle's red borzoi, straining and curving its back, caught up with the two foremost borzois, pushed ahead of them, regardless of the terrible strain, put on speed close to the hare, knocked it off the balk onto the rye-field, again put on speed still more viciously, sinking to his knees in the muddy field, and all one could see was how, muddying his back, he rolled over with the hare. A ring of borzois surrounded him. A moment later everyone had drawn up round the crowd of dogs. Only the delighted uncle dismounted, and cut off a pad shaking the hair for the blood to drip off, and anxiously glancing round with restless eyes while his arms and legs twitched. He spoke without himself knowing whom to or what about. "'That's it! Come on! That's a dog! There! It has beaten them all! The thousand rouble as well as the one rouble borzois! That's it! Come on!' said he, panting and looking wrathfully around as if he were abusing someone, as if they were all his enemies and had insulted him and only now had he at last succeeded in justifying himself. "'There are your thousand-rouble ones. That's it. Come on!' "'Ruge, here's a pad for you,' he said, throwing down the hare's muddy pad. "'You've deserved it. That's it. Come on!' "'She tired herself out. She'd run it down three times by herself,' said Nicholas, also not listening to anyone, and regardless of whether he were heard or not. "'But what is there running across it like that?' said Ilagin's groom. "'Once she had missed it, and it turned away, any mongrel could take it,' Ilagin was saying at the same time, breathless from his gallop and his excitement. At the same moment Natasha, without drawing breath, screamed joyously, ecstatically, and so piercingly, that it set everyone's ear tingling. By that shriek she expressed what the others expressed by all talking at once 
and it was so strange that she must herself have been ashamed of so wild a cry, and everyone else would have been amazed at it at any other time. Uncle himself twisted up the hair, threw it neatly and smartly across his horse's back, as if by that gesture he meant to rebuke everybody, and with an air of not wishing to speak to anyone, mounted his bay and rode off. The others all followed, dispirited and shamefaced, and only much later were they able to regain their former affectation of indifference. For a long time they continued to look at Red Rugay, who, his arched back spattered with mud and clanking the ring of his leash, walked along just behind Uncle's horse with the serene air of a conqueror. "'Well, I am like any other dog as long as it's not a question of coursing. But when it is, then look out!' his appearance seemed to Nicholas to be saying. When, much later, Uncle rode up to Nicholas and began talking to him, he felt flattered that, after what had happened, Uncle deigned to speak to him. End of Book 7, Chapter 6「Book Seven, Chapter Seven, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Chapter Seven. Toward evening, Ilagan took leave of Nicholas, who found that they were so far from home that he accepted Uncle's offer that the hunting party should spend the night in his little village of Mikhailovna. "'And if you put up at my house, that will be better still. That's it, come on,' said Uncle. "'You see, it's damp weather, and you could rest, and the little countess could be driven home in a trap.' Uncle's offer was accepted. A huntsman was sent to Atrodno for a trap, while Nicholas rode with Natasha and Petya to Uncle's house. Some five male domestic serfs, big and little, rushed out to the front porch to meet their master. A score of women serfs, old and young, as well as children, popped out from the back entrance to have a look at the hunters who were arriving. The presence of Natasha, a woman, a lady, and on horseback, raised the curiosity of the serfs to such a degree that many of them came up to her, stared her in the face, and unabashed by her presence, made remarks about her as though she were some prodigy on show, and not a human being able to hear or understand what was said about her. Arinka, look, she sits sideways. There she sits, and her skirt dangles. See, she's got a little hunting horn. Good gracious, see her knife. Isn't she a tartar? How is it you didn't go head over heels? asked the boldest of them all, addressing Natasha directly. Uncle dismounted at the porch of his little wooden house, which stood in the midst of an overgrown garden, and after a glance at his retainers, shouted authoritatively that the superfluous one should take themselves off, and that all necessary preparations should be made to receive the guests and the visitors. The serfs all dispersed. Uncle lifted Natasha off her horse, and taking her hand, led her up the rickety wooden steps of the porch. The house, with its bare unplastered log walls, was not over-clean. It did not seem that those living in it aimed at keeping it spotless but neither was it noticeably neglected. In the entry there was a smell of fresh apples, and wolf and fox skins hung about. Uncle led the visitors through the anteroom into a small hall with a folding table and red chairs, then into the drawing room with a round birchwood table and a sofa, and finally into his private room, where there was a tattered sofa, a worn carpet, and portraits of Suvarov of the host's father and mother, and of himself in military uniform. The study smelled strongly of tobacco and dogs. Uncle asked his visitors to sit down and make themselves at home, and then went out of the room. Rouguet, his back still muddy, came into the room and lay down on the sofa, cleaning himself with his tongue and teeth. Leading from the study was a passage in which a partition with ragged curtains could be seen. From behind this came women's laughter and whispers. Natasha, Nicholas, and Petya took off their wraps and sat down on the sofa. Petya, leaning on his elbow, fell asleep at once. Natasha and Nicholas were silent. Their faces glowed, they were hungry and very cheerful. 
They looked at one another. Now that the hunt was over and they were in the house, Nicholas no longer considered it necessary to show his manly superiority over his sister. Natasha gave him a wink, and neither refrained long from bursting into a peal of ringing laughter even before they had a pretext ready to account for it. After a while Uncle came in, in a Cossack coat, blue trousers, and small top-boots. And Natasha felt that this costume, the very one she had regarded with surprise and amusement at Otradno, was just the right thing, and not at all worse than a swallow-tail or frock-coat. Uncle, too, was in high spirits, and far from being offended by the brothers' and sisters' laughter, it could never enter his head that they might be laughing at his way of life, he himself joined in the merriment. "'That's right, young Countess, that's it, come on! I never saw anyone like her,' said he, offering Nicholas a pipe with a long stem, and with a practiced motion of three fingers taking down another that had been cut short. She's ridden all day like a man, and is as fresh as ever." Soon after Uncle's reappearance, the door was opened, evidently from the sound by a barefooted girl, and a stout, rosy, good-looking woman of about forty, with a double chin and full red lips, entered, carrying a large loaded tray. With hospitable dignity and cordiality in her glance and in every motion, she looked at the visitors and, with a pleasant smile, bowed respectfully. In spite of her exceptional stoutness, which caused her to protrude her chest and stomach and throw back her head, this woman, who was uncle's housekeeper, trod very lightly. She went to the table, set down the tray, and with her plump white hands deftly took from it the bottles and various hors d'oeuvres and dishes and arranged them on the table. When she had finished, she stepped aside and stopped at the door with a smile on her face. Here I am, I am she. Now do you understand, uncle?" her expression said to Rostov. How could one help understanding? Not only Nicholas, but even Natasha understood the meaning of his puckered brow and the happy complacent smile that slightly puckered his lips when Anisia Fedorovna entered. On the tray was a bottle of herb wine, different kinds of vodka, pickled mushrooms, rye cakes made with buttermilk honey in the comb, still mead and sparkling mead, apples, nuts, raw and roasted, and nut and honey sweets. Afterwards she brought a freshly roasted chicken, ham, preserves made with honey, and preserves made with sugar. All this was the fruit of Anisia Fedorovna's housekeeping, gathered and prepared by her. The smell and taste of it all had a smack of Anisia Fedorovna herself a savor of juiciness, cleanliness, whiteness, and pleasant smiles. "'Take this, little lady countess,' she kept saying, as she offered Natasha first one thing and then another. Natasha ate of everything and thought she had never seen or eaten such buttermilk cakes, such aromatic jam, such honey and nut sweets, or such a chicken anywhere. Anisia Fedorovna left the room. After supper, over their cherry brandy, Rostov and Uncle talked of past and future hunts, of Rouguet and Elagin's dogs, while Natasha sat upright on the sofa and listened with sparkling eyes. She tried several times to wake Petya that he might eat something, but he only muttered incoherent words without waking up. Natasha felt so light-hearted and happy in these novel surroundings that she only feared the trap would come for her too soon. After a casual pause, such as often occurs when receiving friends for the first time in one's own house, Uncle, answering a thought that was in his visitors' minds, said, "'This, you see, is how I am finishing my days. Death will come. That's it, come on. Nothing will remain. Then why harm anyone?' Uncle's face was very significant and even handsome as he said this. Involuntarily, Rostov recalled all the good he had heard about him from his father and the neighbors. Throughout the whole province, Uncle had the reputation of being the most honorable and disinterested of cranks. They called him in to decide family disputes, chose him as executor, confided secrets to him, elected him to be a justice and to other posts. But he always persistently refused public appointments passing the autumn and spring in the fields on his bay gelding, sitting at home in winter and lying in his overgrown garden in summer. 
Why don't you enter the service, uncle? I did once, but gave it up. I am not fit for it. That's it, come on. I can't make head or tail of it. That's for you. I haven't brains enough. Now, hunting is another matter. That's it, come on. Open the door there, he shouted. Why have you shut it? The door at the end of the passage led to the huntsman's room, as they called the room for the hunt servants. There was a rapid patter of bare feet, and an unseen hand opened the door into the huntsman's room, from which came the clear sounds of a balalaika on which someone, who was evidently a master of the art, was playing. Natasha had been listening to those strains for some time, and now went out into the passage to hear better. "'That's Smitka, my coachman. I have got him a good balalaika. I'm fond of it,' said Uncle. It was the custom for Mitka to play the balalaika in the huntsman's room when Uncle returned from the chase. Uncle was fond of such music. "'How good! Really, very good!' said Nicholas, with some unintentional superciliousness, as if ashamed to confess that the sounds pleased him very much. "'Very good?' said Natasha reproachfully, noticing her brother's tone. "'Not very good. It's simply delicious!' Just as Uncle's pickled mushrooms, honey, and cherry brandy had seemed to her the best in the world, so also that song, at that moment, seemed to her the acme of musical delight. "'More, please, more!' cried Natasha at the door as soon as the balalaika ceased. Mika tuned up afresh, and recommenced thrumming the balalaika to the air of My Lady, with trills and variations. Uncle sat listening, slightly smiling, with his head on one side. The air was repeated a hundred times. The balalaika was retuned several times, and the same notes were thrummed again, but the listeners did not grow weary of it, and wished to hear it again and again. Anisya Fedorovna came in and leaned her portly person against the doorpost. "'You like listening?' she said to Natasha, with a smile extremely like Uncle's. That's a good player of ours," she added. "'He doesn't play that part right,' said Uncle suddenly, with an energetic gesture. "'Here he ought to burst out. That's it, come on! Ought to burst out!' "'Do you play, then?' asked Natasha. Uncle did not answer, but smiled. "'Anisia, go and see if the strings of my guitar are all right. I haven't touched it for a long time. That's it, come on!' I've given it up." Anisya Fedorovna, with her light step, willingly went to fulfill her errand and brought back the guitar. Without looking at anyone, Uncle blew the dust off it and, tapping the case with his bony fingers, tuned the guitar and settled himself in his armchair. He took the guitar a little above the fingerboard, arching his left elbow with a somewhat theatrical gesture, and, with a wink at Anisya Fedorovna, struck a single chord pure and sonorous, and then quietly, smoothly, and confidently began playing in a very slow time, not my lady, but the well-known song, Came a Maiden Down the Street. The tune, played with precision and in exact time, began to thrill in the hearts of Nicholas and Natasha, arousing in them the same kind of sober mirth as radiated from Anisya Fedorovna's whole being. Anisya Fedorovna flushed, and drawing her kerchief over her face, went laughing out of the room. Uncle continued to play correctly, carefully, with energetic firmness, looking with a changed and inspired expression at the spot where Anisya Fedorovna had just stood. Something seemed to be laughing a little on one side of his face under his grey moustaches, especially as the song grew brisker and the time quicker and when, here and there, as he ran his fingers over the strings, something seemed to snap. "'Lovely, lovely! Go on, uncle, go on!' shouted Natasha as soon as he had finished. She jumped up and hugged and kissed him. "'Nicholas, Nicholas!' she said, turning to her brother, as if asking him, "'what is it moves me so?' Nicholas, too, was greatly pleased by uncle's playing, and uncle played the piece over again. Anisya Fedorovna's smiling face reappeared in the doorway, and behind hers other faces. "'Fetching water clear and sweet! Stop, dear maiden, I entreat!' 
played uncle once more, running his fingers skillfully over the strings, and then he stopped short and jerked his shoulders. "'Go on, uncle dear!' Natasha wailed in an imploring tone as if her life depended on it. Uncle rose, and it was as if there were two men in him. One of them smiled seriously at the merry fellow, while the merry fellow struck a naive and precise attitude preparatory to a folk dance. "'Now then, niece!' he exclaimed, waving to Natasha the hand that had just struck a chord. Natasha threw off the shawl from her shoulders, ran forward to face uncle, and setting her arms akimbo, also made a motion with her shoulders and struck an attitude. Where, how, and when had this young countess, educated by an émigré French governess, imbibed from the Russian air she breathed that spirit and obtained that manner which the pas de chale, the French shawl dance, would, one would have supposed, long ago have effaced? but the spirit and the movements were those inimitable and unteachable Russian ones that uncle had expected of her. As soon as she had struck her pose and smiled triumphantly, proudly, and with sly merriment, the fear that had at first seized Nicholas and the others that she might not do the right thing was at an end, and they were already admiring her. She did the right thing with such precision, such complete precision, that Anisia Fedorovna, who had at once handed her the handkerchief she needed for the dance, had tears in her eyes, though she laughed as she watched this slim, graceful countess, reared in silks and velvets and so different from herself, who yet was able to understand all that was in Anisia and in Anisia's father and mother and aunt and in every Russian man and woman. "'Well, little countess, that's it, come on!' cried uncle, with a joyous laugh, having finished the dance. "'Well done, niece! Now a fine young fellow must be found as husband for you. That's it, come on!' "'He's chosen already,' said Nicholas, smiling. "'Oh?' said uncle in surprise, looking inquiringly at Natasha, who nodded her head with a happy smile. "'And such a one,' she said. But as soon as she had said it, a new train of thoughts and feelings arose in her. What did Nicholas Smile mean when he said, chosen already? Is he glad of it or not? It is as if he thought my Bolkonsky would not approve of or understand our gaiety. But he would understand it all. Where is he now? she thought, and her face suddenly became serious. But this lasted only a second. Don't dare to think about it, she said to herself and sat down again smilingly beside uncle, begging him to play something more. Uncle played another song and a valse. Then, after a pause, he cleared his throat and sang his favorite hunting song. "'As t'was growing dark last night, fell the snow so soft and light!' Uncle sang as peasants sing, with full and naive conviction that the whole meaning of a song lies in the words, and that the tune comes of itself and that, apart from the words, there is no tune, which exists only to give measure to the words. As a result of this, the unconsidered tune, like the song of a bird, was extraordinarily good. Natasha was in ecstasies over uncle's singing. She resolved to give up learning the harp and to play only the guitar. She asked uncle for his guitar and at once found the chords of the song. After nine o'clock, Two traps and three mounted men, who had been sent to look for them, arrived to fetch Natasha and Petya. The Count and Countess did not know where they were, and were very anxious, said one of the men. Petya was carried out like a log and laid in the larger of the two traps. Natasha and Nicholas got into the other. Uncle wrapped Natasha up warmly and took leave of her with quite a new tenderness. He accompanied them on foot as far as the bridge that could not be crossed, so that they had to go round by the ford, and he sent huntsmen to ride in front with lanterns. "'Good-bye, dear niece!' his voice called out of the darkness, not the voice Natasha had known previously, but the one that had sung as t'was growing dark last night. In the village through which they passed there were red lights and a cheerful smell of smoke. "'What a darling uncle is!' said Natasha, when they had come out onto the high road. "'Yes,' returned Nicholas. "'You're not cold?' "'No, I'm quite, quite all right. I feel so comfortable,' 
answered Natasha, almost perplexed by her feelings. They remained silent a long while. The night was dark and damp. They could not see the horses, but only heard them splashing through the unseen mud. What was passing in that receptive, childlike soul that so eagerly caught and assimilated all the diverse impressions of life? How did they all find place in her? But she was very happy. As they were nearing home, she suddenly struck up the air of, as twas growing dark last night, the tune of which she had all the way been trying to get, and had at last caught. "'Got it?' said Nicholas. "'What were you thinking about just now, Nicholas?' inquired Natasha. They were fond of asking one another that question. "'I?' said Nicholas, trying to remember. "'Well, you see, first I thought that Rouguet, the Red Hound, was like Uncle, and that if he were a man he would always keep Uncle near him, if not for his writing, then for his manner. What a good fellow Uncle is! Don't you think so?' "'Well, and you?' "'I? Wait a bit, wait. Yes, first I thought that we are driving along and imagining that we are going home but that heaven knows where we are really going in the darkness, and that we shall arrive and suddenly find that we are not in Otradno, but in fairyland. And then I thought, no, nothing else." "'I know. I expect you thought of him,' said Nicholas, smiling as Natasha knew by the sound of his voice. "'No,' said Natasha, though she had in reality been thinking about Prince Andrew at the same time as of the rest and of how he would have liked uncle. And then I was saying to myself all the way, how well Anisia carried herself, how well! And Nicholas heard her spontaneous, happy, ringing laughter. And do you know, she suddenly said, I know that I shall never again be as happy and tranquil as I am now. Rubbish! Nonsense! Humbug! exclaimed Nicholas, and he thought. How charming this Natasha of mine is! I have no other friend like her and never shall have. Why should she marry? We might always drive about together." "'What a darling this Nicholas of mine is!' thought Natasha. "'Ah! There are still lights on in the drawing-room,' she said, pointing to the windows of the house that gleamed invitingly in the moist, velvety darkness of the night. End of Book 7, Chapter 7